Hi, welcome to LPC Online. I'm Pastor Doug and I wanna thank you for joining us today, especially those who are watching for the first time. If you'd like to connect with us, you can go to our website, listdualpc.com and leave us a message. We really hope that God uses this time to help you grow in your faith and be encouraged.
so I'll stand still until it sinks in. And I will lean back in the loving arms with a beautiful father.
We thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness, your loving kindness. Yeah. 
will see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Human nature is really funny. We are so caught up in getting encouragement and having people give us compliments and life-giving statements, and it becomes such an integral part of how we retain and develop happiness. But what's unique and interesting too is we are so caught up in being critical of ourselves that if you were to get 99 compliments and one single criticism, what is the one thing that you will be focused on? What is the one thing that you would fixate on? I know myself and a lot of the people I talk to, it's the one criticism. It will be the one thing that gets into our heads and won't let go. It will keep coming up over and over and over again. Even though 99 people said it was amazing, you did a great job, I'm so impressed by what you did. But the one person who said, I don't like this, that will become our full focus. And it's interesting because many times we take this approach not just to how we respond to people's criticisms, but how we also approach other people in other situations. We become very, very careful of criticizing people because we don't want to hurt their feelings, that we almost become too careful. And we're in a world and a society now that's so cautious to be critical in any way except when it's directing at whoever is socially acceptable right now to criticize. And then there's a whole reign of criticism that comes down. But what's also unique too is it's how we approach God's word. And the part that we're going to be getting into in Revelation, because we started this series, is all about the, the letters to the churches. And the first letter to the church we're going to look at is Ephesus. And in this letter, it's incredible how there's one criticism but many of us, when we read it, we get caught up in that one negativity and it becomes all we draw from this portion of scripture. 
And I would encourage you to be able to look at the whole letter to see exactly what was said and what wasn't said, what was shared and what it means, not just for the original audience who heard this, but also to us today. But before we get started, I want to just share a verse that's going to be used for context. Context, because we need to understand a little bit more of where we're coming from. Last week, we looked at the first chapter of Revelation, which entailed three different introductions. And I purposely left off the final verse chapter. Uh, It's verse 20 in chapter 1. I left it off, and I didn't focus on that, but I want to read it for you now. Verse 20 says, This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, this is referencing the second part, the third introduction, if you will, of Revelation 1, where John turns around and sees Jesus, and he is an image that is beyond understanding in many ways. He's Hair as white as snow, fire coming out of his eyes, a sword, a double-edged sword out of his mouth. He's holding seven stars in his right hand, and he's around seven lampstands. So now this gives us a little bit more of an understanding of what is going on. Because Jesus, thankfully, wants to give us some greater understanding of this revelation. Now, this verse also characterizes my experience with revelation. And I think many people would agree Jesus takes this opportunity to bring greater revelation. He's trying to peel back that curtain a little bit further so that us who are natural can understand what's happening in the supernatural, that we will be able to understand what this vision should mean for us today. But he only gives us the keys to some of the mysteries, not all of them. He just focuses on the lampstands and the stars. And some of his clarifications are really more confusing than they are helpful. The seven lampstands are identified as the seven churches or communities of believers in specific locations whose purpose is to serve as a light to the world and to all of the people within the the region and their community that are living in darkness. They have been called to shine the light of God and share the gospel. So this makes perfect sense. The lampstand imagery being associated with churches, that's congruent. That's, that's all throughout the Bible. We understand that that is used multiple times. In fact, we're called to be a light, a light to all the world. We're called to be a city on the hill that can't be hidden. That's very, very similar to the imagery of churches. So that makes sense to me, and I'm able to get it. The other part of it that I'm having struggle with is the idea of this revelation of the stars being the angels, the angels of all the churches. Okay? Does he mean literal angels? Is he actually saying that each and every church has a guardian angel? Because if so, that's not crazy, even though it sounds a little bit off. It's not a crazy thing. There are many places in the Bible where people or groups of people are associated with angels. Some of the most uh, interesting ones, we just went over Acts before, Acts 12. When Peter gets out of prison, people are like, oh, no, no, it's not Peter, it's his angel. It must be his angel. That's an interesting one. Hebrews 1.14 talks about how there are angels who are watching over his people, watching over us. The Psalms mention this over and over again. God sends his angels to guard over and protect his people. So this concept of guardian angels is not crazy, but I just don't know if that's exactly what he's alluding to. But there are quite a few people that also associate this as something different. They associate the angel with the original root word, which is angelos, which means messenger, divine messenger. And they say that, yeah, a divine messenger to a church would be the elders and maybe the bishop, the person who's overseeing that region, or the minister inside of the church who is bringing God's truth to them. So in that sense, it could be actually a person who is appointed by God and sent to a church who is serving as their angel. Now, again, we don't know exactly which one is the right one. There could even be a third one that we don't know of, or even more. But the point is, this is how revelation can be very challenging for many of us, as we're trying to understand, because it is a revelation, an understanding of what is unknown in the supernatural that's being brought to us in the natural. 
And this is why I think it's important for us to recognize and understand that God's truth is beyond us. Now, as we focus on this letter, we need to understand some of this because it sets a context for the letter, and that will help us to recognize what is being said here. We're going to be looking at Revelations 2, verses 1 to 7. This is the first letter now that, that John is asked to record. And it's very interesting how this letter starts. Write this letter to the angel, the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. Now, I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me and each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. This is our passage for today. And it is a, an incredible letter that had, does have quite a bit packed into it. And I hope to be able to help you unravel some more of this, this interesting statement that can give us truth that we can apply to our lives today. Let's say a word of prayer so we can have God's help as we approach his word. Father, we thank you for the fact that you've given us your truth. You've given us a word that is uh, so challenging, but also so encouraging. May we be able to take it for what it was intended and be able to also have ears to hear and to listen to the Holy Spirit today so we can recognize this truth and apply it to our lives as well. We thank you so much for how you are patient with us and how you walk us through this as we are very natural and don't always understand your divine truth. But we ask for your help as we approach it today. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing I want to draw your attention to as we get started is the format or the layout of the letter. Because each of these letters have a similar style. They include three main components. The first component is a command that's given to write a letter to each angel of the church. And then Jesus identifies himself as the source of that message, usually through some form of imagery or or incredible analogy that's taken from Revelation 1. So it reinforces that Jesus is the messenger and it's commanded to be written to another messenger to carry it around to the churches. And then it also brings up something that's more specific tied to that church. Some type of compliment, encouragement, or challenge or criticism that's brought up so the church can get themselves to a place where they're operating in full health. And then the final portion of it is where it's ending with a call or a commission for anyone with ears to hear to listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to all the churches. This is showing us that the letters were intended to be read in all the churches, not just one portion of it sent to one church, one portion sent to another. It's like, no, we are going to this region, to all of these churches, and when we read, it's going to be reading about what's happening in our situation and all the other situations in those churches around us. So it's kind of like these churches had their dirty laundry read out by God, but in a way that said, okay, now understand what God is saying to all of these churches and learn from it. Bring yourselves closer together so you can accomplish the purpose God has for you. And then he would end it with a promise, a great promise to those who were victorious, to those who continue to be faithful and accomplish that victory. Now this is again where the letter part comes in. And we're going to be looking at the Ephesian version, the first letter that was written, which makes sense because Ephesian is, is the capital city of that region. When the Romans took over, it became the major city, the major port where everything came in, and most of the trade happened, and it was the Roman center for that area. So it was like the capital of the region. 
And then verse 1 says, This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. Now, I'm always curious, like, why did, why did Jesus choose this imagery for the first letter? What was so important about it? Was he trying to set the scene for all of the rest of the, the letters to make sure that, hey, he's the one that is walking among all the churches. He's the one who's present and active. But I also believe there's another part of it that we often overlook. If you believe and, and understand this idea of the angel being the divine messenger who shows up and brings God's truth and brings his message to the churches, he would be the leader of those churches. And it's very important to recognize too that Ephesus and the church in Ephesus had a lot of great leaders. In fact, they have a timeline of some incredible men and women of God. It started off and was planted by the Apostle Paul. From there, Apollos went and taught there. And Apollos was known as a fantastic teacher. And then there was also Priscilla and Aquila, who Paul sends to go over there, who Paul greatly respected. And apparently they, they had a powerful and wonderful ministry. And then Paul sends Timothy there. Timothy was there, and that became his church that he served at for a great length of time. And then after Timothy was gone, John was also there. This is the church that John was tied to and was a leader in. This was his home church. So we began to recognize there has been a long history of incredible and powerful leaders, messengers from God who have served at that church. But Jesus is very quick to identify something. He holds all of these stars in his hand. He is the one who is truly in control. It's not the human leaders. We fall into a time where there's so much celebrity pastorism. People are so caught up in the leader and they follow a person as opposed to God doing his work. And Jesus is reinforcing to these people who are highly influenced by Roman society around them. It's not about a leader. It's not about a person who's in control. That's the Roman way. That's Caesar who can have all of that authority. Jesus is saying, no, no, I hold all of the stars in my hand, my right hand. They're appointed by me. They're controlled by me. I am the one in absolute authority and control. That's a strong statement. And it would have clearly rung a bell for these people. They would have been like, oh, Good to know. This is Jesus reinforcing again. He's in complete control. Yes, now that John is gone, we don't know who they have an authority there. We don't know who their leader is. They may have been looking for a leader, but Jesus was reinforcing he's in complete control. And then, once he establishes that, he goes into the encouragement, the complimenting, and he brings the good out so that the people can recognize what they're doing well. He says to them in verses 2 and 3, you are doing a great job. In fact, he says, I have seen all of the things you do. I know everything that you're doing, and I see your hard work, your patient endurance, and your patient suffering for and because of me. I've seen what you are going through, and through all of this, you have never given up. This is Jesus thanking them for being champions of the faith, you are going through all of these difficulties and hardships and difficult times, whether it's persecution, whether it's just the challenge of living for God in a community that is so anti-God. And guess what? I am so impressed with how you're continuing to live out your faith, even when it's becoming harder and harder. And Jesus' reinforcements didn't stop there. You are doing some great work. You are not giving up. You're enduring. You're running with perseverance. But then he also says, I know you also don't tolerate evil people. You examine the claims of all who say they're apostles and are really not. You are discovering them to be liars. And you hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as much as I do. That's in verse 6. Now, there's different theories about who the Nicolaitans were. Some think that there were a cult of people that were trying to make the gospel and modern culture fit together somehow, to make the gospel a little bit more culturally acceptable and easier for people who didn't understand God to swallow it. Now, thankfully, that's something that we don't have any experience with these days, people trying to water down the gospel to make it easier to swallow. But this is something that they were dealing with in Ephesus. And this is something that I'm beginning to recognize was a common thing. Now, there's other people who also believe that the Nicolaitans were tied to a leader who used to be an elder in the Jerusalem church. 
but that somehow got caught up in his own ideas and own understanding of the gospel and Jesus' teachings, that he began to lead a whole different style of ministry, a whole different type of work that was against the church and separate. And it was starting to become almost him being another Messiah and leader. Now, we don't fully understand, again, who the Nicolaitans were, but we understand what was being said here in verses 6 and before when he says all about never, never falling for those false prophets and those apostles that come in with the word that's supposed to be from God. They were very, very careful with God's word. They respected the truth, they protected the truth, and they were all about making sure God's truth was always what led them. Now, This is something that they were great to build their faith on. It was something that sustained them to do all the hardships and difficult times when they were going through challenging persecution. And it was what they were using to spread their witness in the community around them. They were bringing God's truth. And I think that this is important because it shows that they were being faithful to what Paul had tried to tell them. In Acts 20, 28, when he's off to Rome, when he knows he's never coming back, he was saying to them, listen, this is the last time you're going to see me, but no matter what, be careful of the false shepherds, those wolves that are going to try to come in, that are going to bring a false message and lies, and they're going to try to take you away. They took that message from Paul to heart. And they did everything in their power to make sure that they were respecting God's truth and clinging to it. That's incredible. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 4 and verse 5 are where things become a little different. Then God kind of switches gears and brings up the negative. He says, I do have, I do have one, one criticism against you. There is one thing that I have against you that I'm not happy with. Again, this is where most of us fixate and the only thing we hear. But verses 4b, he says, you don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. And if you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. The very first thing that Jesus is bringing up here that's a negative, his one criticism against this church, the Ephesians, who, just looking at it from a very simple point of view, is a great church. They're a church that's on fire for God. They're a church that's dedicated. They're a church that is doing some incredible work and enduring hardship and persecution, defending God's truth, and they are caught up in respecting it. But they've missed out on something vitally important. They've forgotten what. It is all about to be filled with God's love. Their faith is supposed to be an overflow from them because they are so full of love for God that they want to do everything for God, that they appreciate everything about him and live in a way that's complimenting to him and respects his truth and his teaching, but also gives them the same heart as God because they want to love everything that God loves. And they've missed that first love. They've become so caught up in the rules and restrictions and commitments, they've almost become religious at heart. And they've missed the incredible love of God that should be their source of energy, that should be what fills them and sustains them, and should be what is overflowing out of them. Not just the people around them in their immediate community of believers, not just the other people in the church, but to everyone outside of the church. They should be full of God's love. This was, after all, the greatest commandment. I mean, Jesus is pretty clear. The greatest commandments I give to you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, they had caught all of the other laws and commandments, but they'd missed the most important ones. Love. This is what Paul was talking all about in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 3. He says, If I speak in the tongues and the languages of men and of angels, if I don't love others, though, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy... And if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith I could move mountains but did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Paul is being very clear here. 
If you can speak in the tongues of the earth people, if you can speak in the languages of earth and of heaven, no matter how full of the spirit you are to speak in tongues, if you don't have love, you're just a noise. You can have the gift of prophecy or understand all of God's secrets, all of his knowledge and his truth. You can understand his truth so well. But if you don't have such love, you would be nothing. And the last part he brings up too, you can be the most generous person in the world, giving everything you have to the poor, surrendering and sacrificing your body, but you would have gained nothing unless you truly were loving. This fits the exact same problem that the Ephesians had. They were sacrificing their body, all right. They were living generously. They were being full of God's truth and understanding what it meant. They were even understanding the spirit and having him guide them. But the one thing they were missing was love. They understood their mission and how to live it. They understood how to be a believer and how to be a light in their community. But they forgot the most important part. Why? Why are you called to be living as a light? Why is God transforming your life and you want to share it with other people? Because you are experiencing the love of God and it's transforming and changing you. And on top of that, you are now needing to be loving to other people because God's love is pouring out of you. They had lost that loving feeling, their first love, because they'd gotten so caught up with the rules, the restrictions, the commandments, they had so become so religious, they missed why, what they were called to be filled with God's love. Now, here's where, again, it's vital and important because this was happening to the Ephesian church. But verse 7 says, Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit, listening to the Spirit, being full of His revelation and His conviction, and understand what He is saying to the churches. So all of the churches are going to be hearing this message and understanding what does this look like for me? What does this mean for me? Do I also need to have this change? Have I continued to love and be filled with God's love? Or am I missing that point and becoming a religious person, not a true follower of Jesus? And then he says to everyone who is victorious, I will give the fruit from the tree of life. In the paradise of God. This is a powerful promise. And it's one that people had understood. But they didn't know was coming. We learn more about this in Revelation 20. When we recognize that there is again. The tree of life that's going to be planted in the new Jerusalem. And we're going to be able to have access to it. Just like the original garden of Eden. Where Adam and Eve were able to eat from the tree of life. And have eternal life. In the paradise of God. The thing that was completely destroyed when sin entered it. And here he's saying to everyone who is victorious, to those who continue to live, to that victory of Christ, where it is brought and they are able to be a part of that celebration, I will give you fruit from the tree of life. Now what's also interesting here is there's also another portion of this that would be vital for the people in Ephesus. The Ephesian city was home of one of the seven wonders of the world. And that was the temple of Artemis. And Artemis was the goddess, this goddess that people would run to for protection. They would actually go into what was a garden inside of her temple, where there was a tree in the very center. And if they were able to make it to that tree, they would be able to be safe. They could have asylum. And they would be able to be taken away so that they could be in a safe place. And all of the authorities couldn't get to them. Here is where Jesus is identifying how you need to be distinct and different from society. Yes, you have a tree too. And I will give you the fruit from the tree. You don't have to run in. I am the one who is bringing my life to you. If you prove to be victorious and faithful, your reward for being a faithful person will be ultimate life in the paradise of God. Not a a place where you can run to and try to escape and be saved by some other God. No, this is God saying this is the ultimate victory and my blessing and reward to you. Now, the big question that comes from this letter, because there are many, but the one that I want to focus on today is specific to how we are living now. Because we have the same temptations that the Ephesians did. We can have the same problems that they ran into if we get caught up in living in the spirit of religion. 
Is our faith merely a set of rules and commitments that we're trying our best to honor, but because we're imperfect people, we will fall and make mistakes. But is that what our faith is? Or is it an overflow of the love of God that is transforming and changing us and then spilling out to all the people around us? Are we more focused on God's love or his truth today? And what is truly at the center of our heart? What is at the center of our lives? Let's say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for how you show up over and over again. You continue to bring what we need when we need it. And thank you for this message today. I know it's been a challenge for me. and It's it's continually brought up a challenge on how I'm living out my faith. I pray that it does the same thing for all of the people who are engaged and who are hearing it today. May you continue to draw them to a greater understanding of what it means to be filled with your love. To love you with their whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to have your love pour out of them for all of the people around them. The people that you're putting into their lives, God. May we be faithful in understanding that this is the greatest commandment for us to live. And it needs to be our source of why we do everything else. May we be filled with a love for you, God, and with your love. And may it transform and change us. And continue to keep transforming and changing us. So that we can actually be making a difference in our world and be a light shining in a a world of darkness. We thank you, God, for your patience, for all the times we mix it up and get it wrong. Help us to get back up and keep trying to get it right and help us to remember it's all about your love. We ask and we pray for this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for for watching. Thank you for being uh, engaged in a part of this message. And it's the first of the letters but it is a powerful one that impacts our life today. And I think the important thing for us to recognize here is that we serve a God who is worthy of all, a God who is worthy of all of our love. And my benediction ties into that. It's taken right from Revelations 5, verse 13. And it says, May all blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb of God forever and ever. Amen? Amen. May that be a reality in our life and in our world today. And I pray that you have an amazing week, a great week, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.